So for our very first panel, um, we're going to take a, uh, a right-hand turn. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and in the spirit of uh, it's not about us versus them, but actually it's about we all together, uh, which is in fact the reality. You know, there's 3.75 billion men in the world and there's 3.75 billion women. And that's just for starters. So it doesn't matter. At, at AREI, we, we're not red and we're not blue. We're green, the color of trees, and in the United States, money. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, the first panel of the day, and Heather Reams will introduce the panelists. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. And this is on, oh yeah, it's on, I hear it. Hey, good morning, everybody. I think it's a joke that I'm the, I'm the moderator at 8.30 in the morning. Everyone in my team knows, like, do not put me on an 8.30 panel. But I've had my coffee, and I am ready to roll. Um, I'm Heather Reams. I'm the Managing Director of Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. Um, I am joined by one of my colleagues, so I'm not going to talk too much about what we do. But we are all um, Republicans. Aren't we all Republicans here? So um, we're going to talk about some of the policies and interests and, um, that we have, um, the politics. And hopefully, we'll, we'll save some time for some questions, because I, I think that's kind of the funnest part of being a panelist when you're mm -hmm. here, is, is having those questions. And we agree we want to have that. So um, we'll take some time, introduce ourselves, a little bit about our organization, um, each, each of the panelists, and then um, we'll have a little bit of discussion. I've got some questions for them. Then we'll take your questions, OK? So Rob, I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, good morning. I'm Rob Sisson. This is my third panel, so I won't give a biography. But um, I'm president of Conserve America. Um, and I guess part of my optimism is 23 years ago, or even 12 years ago, I was like the only Republican at an event like this. But as uh, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, Rod's group, and others have proven, there is a growing, the, the, we're lots of synergy right of center right now. And you're going to hear about that on this panel, I think. And I'm Charles Hernick with Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. I, I do work with my, my colleague Heather here. Um, it, should, do you want to just keep it at a brief introduction? Whatever you want. I'll, um, I'd like to provide a little bit of, of context, and it's sort of weird to be on a panel with your boss. Uh, so I think I'll tell a story that, that even <laughs> she doesn't know. Um, I do want to thank you, Chip, for the invitation to, to be here, and thank you for the other organizers for making an event like this possible. It's not an easy thing to do to get people from all over the, the country and, and from very different backgrounds to work together here. Uh, and for me, it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to talk about renewable energy what my organization, which is an all of the above, right of center organization focused on clean energy, uh, to be here and talk to you all is, is really an honor for me because it follows through on what I think brought us all here, which is a sense of urgency uh, and a real need uh, to act. And what I appreciate about focusing on clean energy is it's about clean air, it's about clean water, but a big part of that is, is climate change too and understanding what we can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the, the pivotal moments in my life where I felt that urgency to act and to get involved and do more in this space, um, I used to do a lot of work internationally with US Agency for International Development. And I spent a lot of time in Africa and Latin America working with uh, truly impoverished communities that have no light uh, and really need to find those first kilowatt hours. And so their energy is everything. Uh, and I was in Mali, which was recently war-torn, uh, where Al-Qaeda had resurged in northern Mali. And in southern Mali, people were living really on the frontier of, of poverty and hunger, and it's a dry, dry, desolate place. And we can talk about climate change here uh, and its impacts, and those are real. But for poor farmers in Africa, for poor farmers in Latin America, livelihoods are really at stake, and a degree change may be all of the difference in the world to whether or not their family makes it to the next generation or not. And so it's really serious that we be able to identify meaningful pathways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And when I view this, I view this not as just a challenge for us here in the United States. What are the policies that we need to do to promote clean energy? Really what do we need to do is identify the opportunities to bring these technologies all around the world. And folks are hungry for it. Folks are hungry for clean energy here in the US. Folks are hungry for clean energy around the world. 
And I do believe that we can use our American comparative advantage to help get those uh, things to market. And that we don't have to use mandates, but we can use markets to kick open the door and provide, give people what they want and create those solutions uh, that we desperately need. So thank you very much for, for the chance to be here, and I'm looking forward to this, uh, to questions in this discussion. Okay. Hi, I'm Rod Richardson with the uh, Grace Richardson Fund. Um, Grace Richardson Fund pioneers new free market solutions to critical issues that are in gridlock. And the reason we do that uh, is that, you know, over the course of my career, I've seen the power of pioneering new ideas, and from the conservative perspective as well. Uh, the early part of my life, I was on the grants board of the Smith Richardson Foundation. In the 1970s, the United States was faced with an energy crisis and stagflation. The economy was going nowhere. We had really high inflation, uh, you know, low growth, and uh, clearly the policy paradigms of the day, which were uh, driven by a version of Keynesian economics, which was not working terribly well, needed to be adjusted. So the foundation was pioneered, uh, you know, a variety of new ideas, monetarist economics, came, uh, supply side economics, and a whole bunch of other uh, approaches which became essentially Reaganomics. And uh, those ideas successfully ended stagflation uh, and uh, set the stage for uh, the internet revolution. Uh, you know, in the, in the Reagan administration, country, companies like Apple and Microsoft were able to go public probably sooner than they would have otherwise been able to because of the uh, you know uh, market-driven policies that were put in place. So those you know while those policies have their critics, they also have their champions and some evidence to support them as well. Uh, but I think that you know cons you know the you know it's really clear that um, policy innovation is key because the 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 underlying uh, situation of the economy changes, and it calls for new, uh, new solutions. Uh, and you know, I, I do not hold, though, with a lot of the, uh, you know, a recent trend in conservatism that I've seen, which you know, the the paradigm of the Smith Richardson Foundation was to identify the problems of the day, find a new pop free market policy solution, and and put it into place. A new paradigm came in, you know, into the uh, foundation world, uh, you know, uh, and I think it had to do with a very fearful response, not just to climate change, but to the, the policies that were being proposed for climate change, which seemed to a lot of conservatives like very heavy-handed statist policies, high taxes, punishing policies, and uh, a group of conservatives thought that this was a big left-wing nightmare that was coming, some sort of socialist solution. And they decided that the best uh, answer to that was to deny that the problem exists. And to me, that seems like a completely bankrupt approach because once you start denying that problems exist, you become intellectually irrelevant. There's no percentage in it long term. Uh, short term, maybe, but long term, the, you know, you'll make conservatism intellectually irrelevant unless you can find good solutions. So uh, I believe there are plenty of good solutions. I think. Uh, you know, supply side economics, uh, you know, offers, you know, is, you know, global warming is a question of supply. Supply of greenhouse gases versus supply of clean solutions. You would cut the tax rates on the clean solutions is, is a perfectly good example. We have great policy, we have, in, in America, we have an incredibly successful tax cutting policy in place for the environment. It's called the conservation tax cut easement. It is a precedent for clean tax cuts. You know, we have, uh, you know, since the 80s, when that has been put in place, uh, 33 million acres uh, of new forest have grown back in this country. Just between 2005 and 2015, 20 million acres were put into conservation easements. So we have a really good conservative policy based on tax cuts that is working like crazy. And you know, we need to you know, come up with new solutions to the challenges of the day. Yep. Uh, you know, and that's why I'm here. I'm glad you're here, thank you. Um, okay, a couple questions for you guys. I think um, you know, 
we're bipartisanship. We've, it makes things happen, ideally. Um, and there's a perception that Republicans are not engaging on these issues, or they're deniers, as, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we change ourselves into doers and, 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 and taking on that? And policies, I think, are, are one of them. Um, but why is it so important to have bipartisanship when we're tackling climate change? Uh, well, I, I want to carry a message of optimism in that regard, but also lay out what the barriers are. Um, a couple years ago, a Republican micro or a Republican data company did some micro targeting in six red congressional districts. And what they discovered were there were 20,000 to 25,000 efficacious Republican voters on average in a Republican district who cares about climate change and would take action on climate change. So, I, I mean, if I asked you guys, ask all of you a show of hands, how many Republicans in, do you think care about climate change? You'd probably say four because <laughs> you can see it for clean energy. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you there are, there, there are tens of thousands in every congressional district and millions across the country that care about it. Yeah. The problem is organizations like CRESS, ours, uh, ROD's is a, a foundation a little bit different. Um, it, it's, it's accumulating list of those voters so we can activate them for our, the policies we support or support uh, politicians who care about this type of thing. Yeah. Um, I, earlier, you know, I mentioned Al Gore's group has 400,000 Republicans and conservatives in their database. LCV and Sierra Club probably have millions. Yeah. We need to get access to those. So if you have any pressure points with those organizations, let's collaborate. Let's make this a truly bipartisan effort. Yeah, Rob, I, I think that that's a great point. And I, I would argue that when we have seen the biggest progress in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions or bringing on renewable energy technologies, it is because of bipartisanship and a, and a movement towards the center and a particular solution on an issue. California has a cap and trade system because Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger worked with Democrats to identify uh, a market-based solution that would work for the state. That was 10 years ago. It was also 10 years ago that, that uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative was born in the New England and Mid-Atlantic states. And just this past year, five out of the nine governors that doubled down and recommitted to reducing emissions were Republicans. And it's, it's because of that balance, and I think that, well, history of working together and, and nothing breeds success like success, uh, where it's been easier for folks in those states and Republicans in those states to uh, create some leadership, and I think that's worth uh, expanding on. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, Rod, how about, <clears throat> you're talking about policy, how does the politics um, weave into the policy? I mean, good ideas are good ideas, right? Mm -hmm. it, how, how does the politics prevent them from taking root? Hmm. Do you see that? And, you know, the good, I mean, the good ideas are there, and I know you've you have many of them, and your foundations and who you're affiliated with have come up with lots of solutions. Mm -hmm. Is there a political problem, both on the right or left, about actually getting them enacted? Well, let me, you know, let me put that back in the context of your question about bipartisanship. Sure. Um, you know, because I'm not really a, a political operator. You know, I do, I'm, not an, I'm not an advocate. Uh, or a champion of ideas. I'm a pioneer of ideas. So I'm, I'm, I'm not as involved in the political process as some. I know more about policy development than I do about, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, walking the halls of Congress and banging on doors, which I'm, I'm very new at. Uh, but, uh, you know, I will say that bipartisanship is extremely important in the policy development process. Uh, you know, the, 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 the clean tax cut concept has been developed using this thing that Amory Lovin suggested called charrette process, which is basically a collaborative working group, group process that brings together people from all different, uh, you know, persuasions. So we've had meetings that bring in the NRDC and EDF people, as well as the Jack Kemp Foundation and the R Street Institute. Uh, you know, I've been on panels, you know, talking about this stuff with Competitive Enterprise Institute people. Mm -hmm. You know, and worked with people like Joan Blades, the, the founder of, of MoveOn.org. And, and the reason that it's incredibly important in the policy development phase is that you really need to anticipate the concerns from all sides of the fence. You need to hear all the different, uh, uh, you know, views when you're building a policy because if you want it to be successful, you've got to have that figured out, 
you know, before you make it your proposal. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your proposal is going to be weak and, and you know, subject to all kinds of problems. So, so that's incredibly important. Um, you know, but to get back to the, the politics, one of the things that I see, you know, in terms of bipartisanship, you know, is that there, there, you know, there is this incredible increasing polarization on both sides uh, that is preventing a middle ground from really, uh, you know, taking hold. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, I would implore my, uh, you know, uh, my, my friends on the, in the Democratic side that you know, you should think about um, actually cheering for moderate Republicans. You know, I think that the moderate, you know, if, if you're going to focus, uh, you know, your camp, you know, campaign strategies, leave the moderate Republicans alone. Give the support to the you know, the Democratic candidates that are opposing the extreme climate denier Republicans. Don't oppose the moderate Republicans. We need, you know, it, you know, to really get effective climate action, you know, it, it may seem like an easy win to Democrats because in those moderate Republican territories, they think, oh, well, we have a concern, you know, about the, the uh, climate, so, uh, you know, naturally this is easy pickings for a Democratic candidate and we can get a Democrat majority if we go after these moderate Republicans. But that strategy is serving to polarize Congress more. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would say give the moderate Republican po politicians a pass. I now, also, think it's a marvelous idea. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and also, you know, when the, uh, you, know, you know, groups like the League of Conservation Voters rate candidates uh, on their environmental score, yeah. please understand that there are some policies that Republicans aren't going to support because they're not conservative. It's not because they're not green, it's because they're not conservative. They will support, I think, other policies that are pro-environment. So I think that the yeah. scoring of the League of Conservation Voters is not fair to, uh, to green Republicans, and I think, I think that that needs to, 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 to change if we're going to develop real bipartisanship. Charles, you want to get in here? Yeah, I think that the, that nexus between good policies and politics really matters, right? It was Tip O'Neill's famous saying that all politics are local. And that's true. Um, things move very slowly at the federal level by design of the founding fathers. It's much easier to do things at a state level. And so to the point of what a conservative policy is, uh, Republicans like to pay big deference to what states can do, what municipalities can do, what individuals can do. Um, and so we need, to, we need to think very clearly where federal policies interact with states. And there's a big challenge there, especially as it relates to energy, because the thing that we've got going for us is I've woken up every morning of my life and I've flipped on the light switch and the lights come on. And that's a big deal. It's because of 100 years of built infrastructure to help make that happen. But to get to that clean energy economy and to implement those new technologies, it's not an easy process because we've got so much built into the ground already. And so energy demand isn't going up in the United States. It's going down. And so every bit of energy that we take off, every bit of fossil fuel technology that's taken off needs, can be replaced by something that is renewable. But there is a stakeholder tied to every bit of infrastructure that's out there. And that makes the politics very difficult at the federal level especially, because jobs are on the line. And so the needle moves probably slower than a lot of us would like, but what I try to do in my role with our organization is try to identify the policies that can work at the federal level, because there are two major sources of error of federal policy. Number one is that nothing gets done in the first place. And that's because we can't come to agreement with all of the different constituencies that are, are across the country, the folks that favor higher hydropower versus solar versus wind and don't like the other types of, of renewables or are tied to nuclear or coal, whatever it may be. Um, and nothing gets done because we can't come to consensus. The other source of error at the federal level is when the federal government does something that overreaches and displeases the states. And the states in their own power, constitutionally, can push back and sue the federal government 
for overreach. And it's that balance that is frustrating to see, but is part of what makes this country great in terms of constitutional powers, laws need to come from Congress, the executive branch can do a lot, but is at the end of the day uh, just responsible for executing those laws that are designed by a, a diverse constituency of members representing this great country. Well, I'd love to hear from you, Rob, about the, uh, the politics policy part. You've been doing this a uh, couple years. Uh, <laughs> Um, we don't have we, we don't have enough time. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I can go on for two hours on the scorecard issues and things like that. Right. One of my one of my board of directors members is a, is a former congressman named Bob Dold. Bob is a moderate from uh, one of the north suburbs of Chicago, and he was defeated in the last election, uh, largely in part because one of the major green groups ran an ad against him, claimed that he wanted to drill for oil in the Great Lakes, which was absolutely false. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I had lunch with Bob last week, and he was just, he was just bemoaning kind of the partisanship of the, the way we organizations have made this into a, uh, a part. Uh, it's become, if you're, if you're an environmentalist, you must, you must support progressive uh, Democrat candidates at all costs. Mm -hmm. And your point, Rod, um, and I've watched this for five election cycles now in Congress, the good Republicans who are actually doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat in the caucus on the Hill get taken out. Mm -hmm. We continue to lose a handful every election because, as you said, those are swing districts, so those are the easy pickings uh, if you want the entire litmus, um, the checklist of all the, you know, the left of center issues, those are the easy pickings. But what that, if you really care, if climate change, is, as we've talked about the last couple days, is the dominant issue that if we don't fix this or address this, really nothing else really matters, um, then come on, folks. We've got to keep these people on the Hill fighting for what we all want and, and the clean energy policies to, mm -hmm. to roll them out across the country. Right. Um, um, it just, I mean, this year we have, uh, of the climate, two years ago, 2016, the Climate Solutions Caucus, I think at that time had 24 Republicans. Not even two years 26. ago. They've, they've grown exponentially okay. in the last year. Well, the big green groups did not endorse or support a single Republican person who had signed on to that, that caucus. And the founder, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in here, the founder of the caucus, Carlos Cabello, in, out of Florida, in the southernmost part of Florida, um, got a very low ranking from LCV on the scorecard, to your oh, point. And they, and they wouldn't let him into the Hispanic uh, caucus, right. the, the, right. the, you know, which is basically dominated by and he, Democrats he's and Hispanics. he's continually engaging, for instance, with my group and other groups in trying to find mm -hmm conservative policies and ideas to be able to bring forward. And you know, it's frustrating. Rob Dole, um, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, endorsed that candidate, put money towards his race. Um, he unfortunately lost another leader that really could be making the difference. We're at that tipping point. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, panel? We're at that tipping point, and this is, I think, an important part that we've, we've, we've brought up. Yeah, well, like, I mean, one, one thing these Republicans are looking for is, do you, is my back covered back in my district by people who care about this? And, and it often appears not because so much money is put into making them, uh, to opposing them in their district. And we've got to change that if we really want broad bipartisan solutions and progress on these issues. Well, great discussion. I wanted to open it up for a couple of questions. Um, anybody have, oh, we've got questions, great. Um, Ma'am, you're in yellow, I saw your hand first. Uh, yes, I've done a lot of work in Florida on constitutional amendments, and the one that really was so exciting was one where, for the first time I've ever seen, we had the Tea Party, the Libertarians, the Christian Coalition, standing side by side with the Green Party, the Democrats, and the Republicans. It was about solar energy. Mm -hmm. The language, we find, is really, really important, and we've used, we haven't used climate change, we've used energy freedom, and energy independence. And I wonder if you could comment on your experience as you have those conversations oh, yeah. uh, and how important language is and what are the phrases that you use to get the support and buy-in and enthusiasm on clean energy, solar energy, and other forms? Great question. Yeah. Sure. I, I think that that's, a, number one, an excellent story, and I appreciate your, your sharing it. And it 
relate specifically to what our, our organization, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, is trying to do. Um, when you talk about environment or climate change, it's not that Republicans don't prioritize climate change or environment or are a bunch of deniers or anything like that. Overwhelmingly, and I ran for Congress in 2016 and, and talked with folks of all political spectrums. The major difference is what, um, the major difference is where people prioritize a particular issue. And when it comes to a long-term issue like climate change, sure, we may be seeing some impacts now. We're likely to see more in five and 10 years and even the most devastating impacts in 40 years, right? That's a long time away. And for folks that are busy, they gotta pick up their kids from soccer, they gotta shuttle them to the next place, they've gotta cook dinner, they've gotta get to work, they've gotta not get fired this week. Uh, people are busy, and you have to understand that. And people are responsive to job, job creation, job opportunity. People are responsive to energy independence and the, the type of wording and, and freedom that, that you were talking about. Folks are responsive to national security and, and understand, and I think that you've seen the greatest progress or push from Republicans on clean energy or renewable energy when it was driven by a high price of oil because OPEC was messing with us in the 70s or OPEC was messing with us in the early 2000s. Um, and you, we need to acknowledge that and think about what are the other hooks that we can be using to talk about clean energy and its, its multiple wins. Climate change is just one of the issues that we're dealing with here. Folks also need jobs. Folks also want to feel secure at home. People want to be energy independent too. Rob, you want to go, and then Ron, you'll go. Yeah, I, I, well, I think I think your your question was about the language that you're using, um, and I think maybe the popular perspective among groups like we have gathered here this week is that you just can't use the word climate, the term climate change, when you're talking to anybody right of center. The right of center really is composed of a bunch of different little tribes too. So you have to know your audience. And I think more importantly, what, what happened in Florida, what happened in Georgia, what's happened across the country, uh, and again, Cress is really at the forefront of this, uh, working at some of the state level, uh, or state policies, and is you got, you've got the Green Tea Party, you have the Christian Coalition, the messenger is m almost more important than the message, uh, because that, that immediately presents credibility and authenticity in the message. Um, Co-opting conservative terms and language is, is a good first step, but you have to have the messenger too, and that's, Great point. that's what our groups are here for. Right. Uh, you know, I think that it's an excellent point that, that language matters, but it only matters to a point. Um, you know, and it, this is why it matters. Uh, you know, it, as I was saying, I asked a question yesterday where I pointed out that the, the, the two key ideas behind the American experiment are liberty and justice. So if your me message is only going to be based on the justice component, you know, climate justice or concern about the environment, and, and you're not going to include the liberty and economics and freedom and prosperity component, you're, you've got an unbalanced message. And you've got to include that component in your messaging. It's very easy to take the climate justice point, uh, which is a valid point, but to make conservatives understand it, transform that into an economic opportunity argument. Yeah. You know, so the economic opportunity, expanding participation for everyone in the economy is the conservative way of talking about that. That's important. But as I say, language only has limits, right? Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, free market language can be used to dress up something that is not a free market policy. And you, you may fool some of the people, but you won't fool all of those conservatives, right? If you're, you know, let me, let me tell you, when it comes to language, there is one word that conservatives are allergic to, and that is tax. So if you're going to propose a, you know, a, an environmental policy that has tax in it, like carbon tax, you're going to lose a lot of your conservatives right away. You know, but, but the, <clears throat> well, that, that, that is, well, you know, all I'm saying is that a lot of the uh, uh, policies, you know, that are that are in place now, that are popular, that are there, are really not that great. And we need policy innovation because, you know, even things like, uh, you know, the ITC and the PTC for wind and solar, uh, while they were very much needed when those things were unprofitable, as those things become profitable, they really constrict the market. They set up barriers. 
you know, for instance, with, with the, those tax credits, only the very richest, uh, you know, highest income investors can take advantage of them. And they, you know, the, even the big investors are disadvantaged and have to, you know, give, pay a lot of money to the bankers for tax equity trading. Yeah. Right. And mom and pop Americans are just frozen out of the market. So we have to find, you know, and I think that a lot of conservatives do understand that those policies don't make a lot of economic sense because of the barriers that they set up. And I think they're hungry for a new approach that brings down barriers. And I think that, you know, if we can lead with a new set of policies, which we really need, which is based on bringing down barriers to participation and letting people prosper from the clean energy economy. If that's the leading message, I think we're going to find a lot more of a bipartisan uh, support for uh, movement forward. Excellent. Well, we are out of time. I know there's questions. We'll have to, you know, I'd love to, I think we all would welcome having a conversation with you in the hall or at lunch. Um, but to be a good moderator, I think I have to say we're done. Thank you so much <laughs> for having us. Thank you. <laughs>